you deserve to train yourself to be grateful, for goodness sakes. It is yeah. so great. Everybody, welcome to today's episode of the Jeff Heilman Project. I'm back. If we were gone, did we miss a week? We may have missed, we missed one week. Our first week since February. Oh my goodness, we missed our first week since February, but with good reason. I was out of the country <laughs> on Bon Voyage and uh, away. But this is today's episode is going to be a little bit of a recap. We're going to have a little dialogue between my husband and I about this most recent trip. And then we're going to get right into the subject matter of the day, which is to talking about just gratefulness and celebrating with you. Hopefully wishing, praying, hoping that you had a fantastic Thanksgiving meal yesterday that the football team of your choosing won if they were playing and that you're just having a wonderful Friday and gearing up into the holiday season with the weekend. The Washington football team. What are they now? They're not the the commanders. The commanders. I hope they beat the commanders. We're recording this on Tuesday, but we're not publishing it until Friday. So by the time this goes live, everybody will know whether or not the Dallas Cowboys beat the Washington Commanders or not. Go if Cowboys. I knew more about football, I would probably insert a joke here about how wish in one hand. What did Dave Eggers used to say? Eggers wish in one, say, hand, one hand, poop in the poop other. In the other see, see which, which one weighs, weighs more. more. <laughs> exactly. Nice. Thanks, Dave. We'll see. We'll From see how grave. the team. Anyways, like I was saying, I'm I'm praying and hoping <laughs> that whoever it is that you wanted to win the football games for the day that your team won and that that is a sign of things to come for the rest of your 2023 experience that it would continue to be winning and up and to the right yeah quarterback for uh 49ers had a perfect passing rating perfect passer rating on sunday um booty Bodhi, Brody. i'm trying to think of what his name is i don't watch enough 49er football because i care about the cowboys but yeah, he's like 23 years old, and he had a perfect passer rating and crushed, crushed it well, on Sunday. I'm sure that that makes Dad Amazing. very happy. Considering yeah, he's got he's a great a self-image. Lifelong 49ers Booty. fan. Brody, Bodie, Booty. So, how was your week? Uh, my week was. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me of... what we had for. What did you eat? And I said we had waffles. No, no, no. For the week, what did you have? I said waffles. Waffles Let the record butter, show that I left more food than just waffles, waffles, waffles butter, in the waffles kitchen. Waffles with gravy, waffles yes. with chicken. I, I did yes. bake an entire ham before I left <laughs> and left ham. And you had I ham? made chi- there was what? ham what? and there was chicken. and There I was don't... ham in the fridge? You're going to have to ask Andrew and the I kids what happened to the ham. I never even saw but ham. There, there I was... saw an empty fridge on Saturday evening. Nope. When I left, I left with baked ham and I left with crusty, musty nice. chicken, which is a... What? There was yeah. crusty mustard mm-hmm. chicken? Yeah, there was... So I'm just telling cr- you, I had so waffles for everyone, nine days straight. For those of you that are listening... And Nutella. Well, no, not Nutella. Nessie had no Nutella. Crusty, musty chicken is mustard. this crusty recipe that I got about... Let's see. 30 years ago. We've been ago. married 27 years. When, yeah. when were you working crackers. with, we've talked about the the famous, um, I'm not going to say infamous, the famous Paul, because <laughs> I got the recipe from, I got the recipe from nice. Teresa, his wife. Did you really? You got mm-hmm. mu- crusty mustard chicken came from Teresa? Yeah. So how long? Teresa means her. That was 27 years ago, because I, kn- I knew Paul before yeah. I met you, yeah. and uh, so... Okay, we so this recipe, and because we we're just going to, today is just a super fun episode, today and we're going to talk fun. about You small went to talk. Paris, for I know. God's sake. I, I'm going to tell them What's how up? to make Hashtag the chicken. bucket list. You're just in rare form today. You're just I am in yammering form. today. I brushed Nessie's hair. We'll have to talk about the, ca- the uh, conditioner. Crusty chicken. <laughs> You t- you get chicken breast, you get uh, skinless, boneless chicken, and then you slice it. You, you got to make sure you either pound it to the same thickness. It all has to be the same thickness or slice it so that it's all the same thickness. Take a casserole dish that's uh, nine show. by 
Nine by 13 or whatever yeah. it is. And then whatever standard casserole. What do you use for mustard? Is it Golden's or do you do... So it... it, it Grape upon? It's or? whatever mustard you have, but I usually use the French's or whatever, the, the plain non-honey mustard, just a regular yeah. mustard. Yeah. So you take your chicken, you make it all the same thick, you beat it or slice it so it's all the same thickness, and then you spread it out into the casserole dish. And you spray some butter on it, you know, the butter spray, and then you put the chicken out. And then in a bowl, you take mustard and mayonnaise uh, a lot. I, I don't, I just kind of eyeball like it. A quarter cup, between a quarter and a half a cup of mayonnaise. It's, at, it's, least, it's mayonnaise. at least a half of a cup of mayonnaise to yeah. like a quarter of a cup of mustard, however yep. you like. But it's getting, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get that tangy mustard mayonnaise taste like a chick-fil-a sauce or yeah. uh yeah. uh you know like a thousand island dressing basically and so you're so you take the mustard and your mayonnaise and you mix you beat that all up whisk that all up and then over the years i've begun to add like um italian seasoning oregano just 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 kind of making a beautiful mustard mayo sauce and as a matter of fact when we were in france that is, you know, they love their mayonnaise in France. They love their Bernays, their Hollandaise. They love their sauces, and a lot of it is is uh, has a foundation of mayonnaise. And so, so anyways, so you're making this this I mustard mayonnaise sauce with seasoning in it, and you whip that up, mix that up, and then you put spread that all over the raw chicken, and then you break up. Ritz crackers. Wait, you put mayonnaise on raw chicken? Yeah, mayonnaise and mustard. The sauce goes on. You 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 spread it all out on top of the raw chicken, mm. and then you break up. That's why you have to have the chicken breast all the same thickness because if you right, have varying right. de- heights of chicken thickness, then it won't cook evenly. And then you spread out the um, the sauce all over the chicken breast, and then you take the Ritz crackers. You crumble it all up into you know you break it up. And then you sprinkle that all over the top. Then you bake it for about 45 minutes. And then it's cooked. And it's called crusty musty mustard. because it's got mustard. But the kids call it crusty, crusty musty. Crusty mustard. Crusty musty chicken. You don't eat musty chicken. So I left crusty musty chicken. You're fit because I know that's a household favorite here. And I left ham. And I left bread. And, and waffles. I had their fruit snacks. I left all kinds of food, but I did come home to the, uh, thankfully I took a Marco Polo and I sent it to <laughs> Natalie of the refrigerator. And I said, at least they cleaned it because there weren't a whole bunch. Usually I, did, I asked Osh if he would clean that. Usually the, the, the when fridge. the fridge, when the articles, in, the items in the fridge have been depleted, the yeah. empty yeah. carcass it looks like the of it of is blown up still, microwave. Yeah. remains in the refrigerator normally, normally, normally right. the empty milk carton yeah. and the empty yeah. egg carton Plus, and, but to, there was, there was props nothing where so. props is due andrew did the dishes like top to bottom left to right front to back spick and span every day like he does it times, every day four times during the eight days that you were gone yeah, so he does it every day it was perfection by the time you got back and you know the well i'm glad that y'all survived and you you made it <sighs> you made it the week we that did. we were gone yeah. that that you have maintained your st- Intuitiveness and that your resolve was that you were going to survive, even if it was on egos. I think it was funny that Jackie said that Eggos. that it's you good. ruined our uh, my go to your go to. Yeah, that, Jackie. That you- <laughs> Jackie was saying, "Oh, nice job! You ruined our go to because now the kids will never eat waffles again because we ate three cases of waffles while you were gone." <laughs> but I don't know if that's true. I don't. I don't know that that's true. But so anyways, I, Madeline and I had a very good trip. A what very, about you, Andrew? What did you, how do you feel about, how did you fare during your did you, did you survive? mom being gone? Did you survive okay? Yeah, it was fine. <laughs> it, was, it was fine. The crusty musty chicken was in the Tupperware. Uh, there was a stack of different Tupperware tubs in the fridge that I don't know. I can't. I can't I'm do leftovers. I think stuff. it's it's gross to just eat food that's been sitting in a <laughs> fridge, so I don't eat leftovers. We need but dots. We need a dot system like the restaurant. We have but the I stickers. I ended up throwing it all out eventually. <laughs> oh, my God, you guys. <laughs> I'm with you, Andrew. And this Anything is that's why in a I have to Every make time I ask your mom, like, is this, when was the last time that we changed the dots on the chicken that's in the red Tupperware? And she's like, I don't know. I think that was given to us in March. This trip, 
I made sure <laughs> to pre-cook the food in advance <laughs> so that you would have food to eat. But if you do not like choose to like eat, like I said, I had waffles. We we're food. good. You bought waffles. That's if you what, choose that's not to eat the food, that is not my problem. <laughs> I was busy so in France. So let's talk about Paris a little bit. Now you had you guys stayed out of town, so you had to take the train in. But when you were in town during daylight hours, when you got to see the Mona Lisa, you got to see the Arc de Triomphe, you got to see La Tour Eiffel, you got to see the Metro, you got to see um, the uh, the Van Goghs and the Gauguins and the Rodins at both the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay. By the way, everybody on planet Earth knows about the Louvre, but. The Impressionist paintings are at the Musée d'Orsay. How, how was that experience? Uh, the, the Louvre is very much an architectural uh, masterpiece with the pyramid and the glass and the building that it's surrounded by. And so for us, as we, Madeline and I both very much admire the sculptures and the Renaissance art, which is the Louvre is where the... Uh, the Mona Lisa is and yep. and other works from Michelangelo. A lot of Renaissance, 1500s um, stuff. For right. for me as a art student, for one who really does, uh, you know, I love I I I love all of it. I I, ha- I can appreciate every single. I think that the most impressive thing for me when it comes to Renaissance art is just how so many of them can look so much like a photo like a photograph and and you you go and you wonder like yeah. oh my goodness this is yeah. this could this could this is so realistic it could be a photograph um so that i can really admire in the the just the mastery of the detail um but for for me the louvre is more about the architecture of the actual building itself yeah. of the napoleon's apartment is they've they've Ooh. kept Napoleon's apartment because of the palace and and they toothbrush everything they kept the apartment so you can go and you can see the the throne like there's a throne and then nice. you're walking through and it's his his apartment and you can see the room and so that's pretty cool um the Musée d'Orsay is a train it was at one point a train station okay. and they've converted it into a uh, art gallery and there, it, like you said there was you know the Renoir the Manet so it's much more devoted the entire museum is more devoted to art of yeah. the impressionist time period which when Renoir, when did the, the impressionist the party, the party impressionist, by the river. that was like 18 when did impressionism really begin it's boy I'm gonna take I'm gonna go out on a limb here because those who might be listening that uh, could look this up I, I want to say impressionism Monet was like late 1860s to yeah. early 1890s. I'm guessing. I'm, yeah. Forgive me, those of you so, who are So yeah, I guess buffs, in, in that in that we'll have to look that up and in that Andrew can make some definition. It's it's more it. modern. It's a more modern uh, time period. The Renaissance. Well, the Louvre modern, covers modern modernity is relative, right? I mean, it's still 150 years old. Going through the Louvre and seeing like. You know, I mean, they had, they like had 15, 60, and, and they to, had things older than that. Like, they had sculptures and like they had Sphinx and, you know, they had things from yeah. Egypt Egyptians. that were, that were very, very old. So, well, and then there's this period of time between the fall of the Roman empire and I want to say 460, yeah. 460, 463 AD, How somewhere in there. You think of the Roman empire every Jeff? day. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think the fall of the Roman Empire was like 463, somewhere in there, plus or minus like six, seven years. I can't say, and I can say that I do legitimately think, it, as that meme goes, I, as a woman, do legitimately think of the Roman, Empire. the Roman Empire. However, whenever I think about the Roman Empire, it. why are you, why are you arguing you with me? think about Pompeii, where the women are like, like no. this, right? No. When I think about the Roman Empire, <laughs> typically it's one of two reasons. One, it's in direct biblical reference because we are constantly, you know, doing teaching yeah. out of the Old yeah. Testament and New Testament. So yep. there's a lot of Roman Empire oh. involved in the Bible. But the second is I'm always thinking about the Roman Empire because I'm still, my brain still finds it fascinating that the cars that we drive today are the same tire distance away from 
because of the because butts, of the, the horse yeah the, the chariots yeah and the, the that the trains that we use are the yep. same and yep. the cars are the same and that we're still that that we haven't gone to a wider footprint or a much narrower yeah. footprint and but we're still basically driving around in horse drawn carriages. I don't know if the Koenigseggs in Sweden are <laughs> still su- succumbing to the Roman Empire. Uh, yeah. Um, metrics, but yeah, it's got to be pretty close. It's I mean, pretty it's fascinating. Horse butts and people butts. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Basically it's it's it's. About. I always think it's fascinating to think of even like the space shuttle is yeah was designed to be able to go on the back of a train the back of a train and that is the butts. same footprint of horse butts <laughs> and chariots wow. and so even going into right. space sure. it's related to the roman empire yes. so anyways i digress horse but, butts in but space. to answer your question the musée d'orsay the louvre uh, the louvre itself to me is an architectural uh, masterpiece it like super touristy to you because everybody goes oh, well what we madeline what time. madeline observed was that whereas you, you and her and I, we've done a lot of uh, museums in the States yes. and, and she noticed, she's like, you know, the, I don't, she's never been to a museum, even when you went to Detroit to where the wait to get in was as long as the waits, like, like, like there were, it was a rainy Monday and we were waiting in line for over an hour just to get into the Louvre with all these people, like hundreds and hundreds yeah, of people. Yeah, in late November, like you in would think that at noon, that like our our, not our time really slot, be the busy time. Our allotted time slot was twelve thirty because I had to pre-order the tickets. I okay. bought the tickets online. What were the tickets for the Louvre? Thirty-five dollars, forty-five dollars. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't that much. It was, you know, less than fifty dollars for the two of us. Yeah, probably. Um, and, but to be able to, so we, our time slot was 1230 and we didn't get in the front doors until like one thirty. So we were probably in line Man. for almost an hour just to get in and with we're standing paid outside for with, tickets yeah, with paid and for a timestamp. Yeah. And a timestamp. So on a Monday in a rainy mid to late November. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. But I mean, if you look at Paris, it's, uh, I think it was 12 to 15 million live in the Paris as an MSA. And they have over 35 million Isn't people. Isn't it true? Andrew, didn't Washington say, or at least Twice did you as many that tourists each year more than tourists than residents? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's it's a known thing that the French people there can be very arrogant at times because they see more tourists than actual French people. Yeah. And I, I as a, as an observer, I, I we felt we felt more Parisian than probably a tourist because of the amount of time that we spent on the metro. I mean, we were busing, we yeah. were taking the metro Short line in, and makeup in and an hour a no day, every soft, day. Soft social shoes. And we felt, we felt very much as locals and, and they treated us as locals. And so we were, we were feeling very accepted because we worked to fit in and I tried to bring my broken French to the table. You're not come <laughs> And, uh, I was say I was thinking to myself, man, it would be so frustrating to be living here because of the fact that you have to repeat your. Not only do you, yeah. it, not only do you have to be bilingual in order just to basically do anything to get around, you have to repeat. You have to not only just be bilingual, yeah, you have to you say everything twice. you imagine if you had to say everything in Mandarin after you said it in English first? Said it in English. No, yeah. it w- I would Punjabi be. Or- <laughs> would be irritated to as a national Indeed. to have to that like tough. like to have yeah. to repeat everything that I was saying in multiple languages yeah. just to be able to have commerce just to be able to do things but, but if you think about it if we had you know Silicon Valley's got 16 17 million people if you had 40 million tourists a year I don't know that's enough money I'd learn how to speak Punjabi yeah for 40 million yeah well I would do it. Uh, so it was. It was very. It, it, they weren't. I, we we didn't. We didn't come across the stereotype of the rude uh, French. The French were. That's extremely, another question. Everybody thinks that Parisians are rude to Americans. And no, I. They, you they, just try, right? You just try it, to speak English. From what I understood, from what I saw culturally, the difference in their culture is that they're not very warm and friendly to strangers. But that's not just because of 
uh, maybe they're it's not because for anybody. It doesn't no, seem they like... are for each other. Like when we had okay. uh, Jeff Bush on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about being in the gondola yeah. and how the Italian gondoliers were like, la, 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 you know, they're talking and they're having a good time. And here they are, you know, they're whatever the minimum wage or just, a, you know, I don't know what a gondolier gets paid, but but here they are, these people that are just talking nonstop for you know, a 40 minute gondola, yeah, like and he's going, back and forth. he's going, how much do you have to talk about? You know, like, <laughs> how can you be talking this much? Because, but that's how the French, that's how the French were with their coworkers. So we'd be riding on the bus and the two people that were working together, like being on, in the shuttle bus together from the hotel to the train station, they were just blah, 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 blah. like they hadn't seen each other in like, Two years. They were just like, blah, 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 talking, talking, talking. And then another coworker would get on the shuttle bus to take the drive, blah, 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 and they're talking, talking. And then you look at the waitresses, the wait staff while you're being served, and blah, 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 they're just talking, nonstop talking to each other. But then you get on the train, and it's predominantly strangers. Nobody talks to each other. Nobody looks, makes eye contact. They're, and it's not that they're all on their phones, because they, if, they either didn't hold anything in their hand, or they had a book. Or they had a phone, so there there was no like. Um, and then, did you have any trouble with pickpockets? Because that's a big thing too. So let me finish. Let me. Hold so this is the <laughs> cultural thing that I noticed. I okay. noticed in America here, especially in the Silicon Valley, we are so propagandized against um, work inner work relationship like you better be careful with being politically correct you better oh, yeah. be careful you with fired for looking at you, you better be way. careful like we're so concerned in america about losing our jobs yes that um we are uber sensitive to who we hang out with who what we say how we how can we can we pat so and so on the shoulder like do we we don't even touch people when we greet them when we work with them because we could lose our jobs you could That's lose right. your job that it and so as a kind of a balancing like a um, you know equal equilibrium to in order to equalize equi <laughs> equalize that we are very fam familiar with strangers we get very comfortable with strangers if it's a New York City I I haven't been in New York City I've been on the subway like one time but if we were in public transit here at least like if we're gonna take a the tran the Bart to uh, San Francisco to go to a game or something right if if we're like within two inches of the next person the next writer and we don't know them in America we're gonna make small talk because you feel like you should like you, like here's this person they're breathing my air we're breathing each other's yeah. air hey how was your weekend hey, how's it you going? know you, how's the you don't smell bad exactly what do yeah. you think what do you think about this 49ers or, or the Biden administration I don't know you just yeah. you just come up with something to talk about and so then you, you before you know it because you're armpit to armpit with with this person for 40 minutes on your way up to san francisco yeah, now best, you got best, best buddies best you're buddies having beers they're buying you a beer. exactly exactly but not not in france it's the wow. other way around it's like buddy buddy and ki you know i notice like the the kissing of the cheeks which is bees they're giving each other bees they're holding each other and they're what's, working what's together the What's the bees? What is that? E E E S is is when you kiss the cheek when you greet somebody. Is that, is that you, really a thing? Yeah, and that's the way of huh. saying hello, and it's called a bee. Huh. And so, so uh, the cultural difference between at work, like they, I think that they recognize that the people that you work with are the people you spend your most time with because this is this is basically in essence yeah, between your, work and the metro, your family. This yeah. is your family. And so you better be familiar with your family. And so they're very affectionate wow. and very culturally um, accepting. And, and they have a very close continuity with their work people. And they do not open up that circle to the people that are strangers. And so yep. therefore it comes off being very serious when you're in an environment where everybody are strangers, it it there's there's a level of tension that seems like 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 nobody's saying hi nobody's smiling everybody's very serious everybody's you know just very quiet and there's no i mean nobody was listening to music no phones were ringing no babies were crying no dogs were barking it was very quiet very serious very very much like in the zone and just going and and so madeline you know as a 21 year old now in december she was just like, I don't know how you would even make friends. Like, how do you, we're so accustomed to 
being like being you know meeting people that way that that she was like how do you meet people and i said well you must meet people through your job you mu you must yeah, that that sure. must be you how you meet people is through your job and so that was that was kind of the main thing that i that we noticed and and so i didn't find anybody rude because once you crack that and once you say you know um you know, you say bonjour and, and como allez-vous and, you know, como ça va? And, and then they then they crack open and then they start talking to you. And, and once you make that initial contact and, and attempt to try to show that you know how to say hello and how are you and, and you know, je ne parle français, uh, je parle anglais. So, and then you talk and, and they, they talk. Je suis américain. Yeah. Comprends pas français. Je suis, well, I, I'm American. Je suis, I understand. Je suis American. <laughs> yeah. He comes from l'anglais. L'anglais et français. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just walked around. You can, you can absolutely get through France not speaking French, only speaking English. That was a big one. That was um, a big question. You for can absolutely get through France and, and be, because like I said, especially in Paris. Now, I don't know. South of France, when where they don't have to repeat everything twice because they're that's where they're from and that's where they were born and that's where they're going to die you're on your own you better you better learn some key phrases in order to get yourself yeah. in order to get yourself through the south of france or some outside of the city of paris but in paris itself you how did can it absolutely feel? how did get it around. feel to actually be in the city of paris when you had wanted to be there for 30 years since you started taking french in high school well it's very um I feel like because we live in California and we are so exposed in the Bay Area specifically to the uh, cultures, multicultures, that we're very fortunate to live a European lifestyle. Like the fact that we can walk down the streets and, and go into a restaurant and go into cafe and and to live outside and, and eat more or less a Mediterranean diet. We're not, we're not foreign to Greek food and Italian food. And, and we're very fortunate where we're at that, that it felt very much like home. It like, it felt, it didn't feel no. odd. It's definitely it. If you are a, if you are a student of architecture and, and just like history, you have got to do, you've got to do your, Art to make it to France, to be able to see the architecture and the history. Um, one of the things that E.B. was talking about, and, and it really hit home when I was there, it really kind of clicked over when I was there, was she was saying, what, what E.B. was saying is, look at all these buildings, because it's just, built, it's, it's pre-war, world, first war, not not World War Two. Pre World II. War One. Pre World War One buildings yeah. everywhere, and she said that this is why the French were so easy. This is why the French were so quick to surrender at, throughout all of these wars they throughout didn't want history, Germany destroying their city the, to, in order to protect their buildings. And so they have the great, like they have like the, one of the greatest percentages of pre war buildings in the in history because of their their intent to just surrender any time that they were under attack because they, they didn't want it's them. they're smart. So, so now you will see, and she said, now look at this. So you see these buildings, like this is the, you know, pre-war, pre-war, pre-war. And then there's this like kind of God awful. Yeah, ugly. You think pre-war, like the war started in 1914. So if there's buildings that could be there yeah, we from went to 1880s, Le 1870s, Le Cope, which was established was in 1689. Napoleon Bonaparte would have coffee at that restaurant. Yeah, and that was 200 and something years old when he was there. Yeah, and Voltaire was, was it, Voltaire used to sit at the desk and write and things like that at that same cafe. Yeah. Um, so, but you would go through and you'd, and you'd look through the buildings and she'd say, so, so pre-war, 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 and then there'd be this kind of hideous looking, like 1980s looking building, you know, skyscraper type building, and, she, and she'd go, and that's where... Uh, the bomb would have hit. And so, 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 wow. So, and then you'll see, and you'll see building, 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 and then you'll see like, and like Madeline's like, those, those buildings right there. 
and it's like ha half of the building, entire building is missing, and you can see the bricks, the exposed wow. bricks on the side. And oh. it's like, well, that's oh, where the bomb for the rebuild, or, or there, or there's just nothing there, and yeah. and and th that's where the bomb would have taken half of this building off. But wow. there, the walls were so thick in between that you that they just right. kept the other half. You know, no, there's no building code to where that says like, okay, well, just because the I'm building sure came down, code, but well, yeah. not in not, not world in war one or whatever yeah. <laughs> right so so that was very fascinating so so like i said if you're if you're into architecture at all and have a passion and a a, a fascination for history uh, the and and world war like wartime history of world war one world war two uh you absolutely want to make it a goal to get to france and to go to paris specifically and see the the architecture and the sculptures, and it's definitely uh, when I think of France. I use when I think of art, I would think initially as a child of uh, in the impressionist arts yep. and the impressionist artists, because so many of them came out of France. But it's really the city itself harkens to sculptures, scu like like the masters of the sculptures, and so sculptures and buildings. Do you see the Rodin and Degas sculptures in either yes. Musée d'Orsay? In have been Musée the Orsay, right? Musée d'Orsay, yeah. yeah. The Degas, the ballerinas, and yeah. the, the sculptures. We saw when we were in uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in uh, MoMA, uh, Modern Museum of Art, on 56th. The folks that are listening to this podcast are going to call me out on having the wrong streets. I'm, I know they will, but... Um, we we went to MoMA and and um, the Met both in September with Madeline and oh my God there was probably there was like forty or fifty Rodin sculptures all bronze all you know little little guys they weren't real yeah big, I didn't but. realize that like uh, when we went to the De Young up here in San Francisco yeah. And they have a thinker there, and then I, I you know, I, I hadn't they had realized a thinker, like a replica. No, they because he made more than one uh, statue because it's cast bronze, and so oh. there is one. There's there's one up here in San Francisco. I think there a were thinker? like not nine of them oh. um, initially made. Ulti Andrew, thinkers. how many do you remember? Uh, we'll was it you that, that was talking about the Statue of Liberty? That there's like. There's, there's a lot of different ones. There's, there's like 14 ones, yeah. of them or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but they're smaller. Yeah. They're not. They have, like, full they have size. like, I think they have like two or three like full size ones. And then they have like 10 or so like the smaller, smaller ones. ones. Yeah. Oh. I saw, we saw one of the smaller ones when okay. we were in Paris. But so it'd be a thinker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. so not the, th so perfect example, especially with, um, statues is that you don't think you, you yeah. a lot of times you think there's only one but there can be more than one the ones that we were the, the ones that i'm just the most like in awe of are the marble sculptures with like the draping of the fabric yeah. and the yeah the fabric and the the weave and the folding and the yeah. weight of the fabric that they yeah, figured out how just, to do that that's amaze balls that's as elizabeth I, I, I look at so. i look at those things and i think they didn't have cell phones they didn't have they didn't have the yeah, internet. Somebody had a whole lot of time on their hands because <laughs> they could spend two years working on the fabric and exactly. it looks ridiculous. But and then it lasts like seven hundred years. So yeah. it's like it's good trade. Hey everybody, this is Jessica. I'm so excited to offer to you this new service and this ability that you have to text in your questions, comments. Maybe you have some situations that you'd love for Jeff and Jessica to try to tackle along with you. You can text us now at 203-646-1472. Your phone carrier may have standard rates that apply, it being a text, but this is a free service from us to you in which we would like to participate with you in an ongoing conversation about how we can help and what we can possibly do for you. Looking forward to hearing from you soon.
but to but to continue on with our conversation, Paris was awesome. But what we really what I'd really like to talk about in this episode, and and this is probably Where's goes your biggest in takeaway. I gotta I gotta we gotta ask that. Like, this is the the in order to segue into the second part of our podcast today is just gratefulness. You know, I'm so grateful. I think that one of the things that I was grateful for is how I was grateful to be able to go on the trip. For sure, that's a trip of a lifetime. A lot of people dream of, if not, it's so far out of the realm of their possibility to one day be able to go to a place like Paris. But so I was grateful to be able to do that. But but really grateful for this continuous desire that you and I have towards personal growth and education and how much you know, this podcast was designed to bring the humanities to entrepreneurship, to to just our desire to lead and live, an, number one, you know, an aesthetically pleasing life. Like, are we surrounding ourselves with things that are of beauty? Yeah. And then yep. being grateful that we've been given this amazing opportunity, whether it's because we were raised in the Silicon Valley or I, I told Madeline, I said, you know, I think a lot of our desire to see these this live this type of lifestyle with art and museums and music and the classical way of living is because we were because you and I both were raised by our influenced greatly by our grandparents and that generation of just being that old being that next generation being that being the early 1900s uh, generation, you know, not, my grandparents were 1930 through today, and your grandparents were 1930s, mid 30s, yeah. and and to be able to have be able to be influenced so greatly by a generation which had just come out of the war, war times, had a sense of propriety, had a sense of you know wearing suit is still in their recollection of what you know dress code having a dress code to do things yep. having having cocktails before dinner before like a, with a decorum of these types of like procedures the, there were these systems that were put into place in order to function socially like we grew up not ever hearing about anything like social anxiety or or things like that because what part of what I think attributes to social anxiety today is not having a knowledge of the rules behind the cues of how to how to behave in society but are the generation of our grandparents were very much so into hey there's 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 rules of engagement when you're in society and we're going to teach them to our ladies and we're going to treat teach them to the gentlemen and so because we're teaching what the rules are to how to properly act in society, there's not, there's not much social anxiety because you know what you're supposed to do. You, you know the cues, you know what you're supposed to do when you are in society. But now one of the bigger things upon this generation that I keep hearing over and over again is social anxiety, social anxiety. How do I, you know, I don't want to go into public. I don't want to, I, I get anxious when I'm in society and i think a large part of that is because we've had an entire generation that wasn't isn't being taught the cues for how to behave in so, in social situations that's right and yet our grandparents who influenced us so greatly it was very important for your grandfather to teach you well and my mom how to my have, mom was always be she would always edify my grandma yeah. and my grandpa and she would say they're straight they're straight you got to be on your best behavior yeah. like they have a very high standard and I'm like, what happened to our standard? Like polishing your shoes, yeah. creasing your pants. Or vans today. So you know, but, 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 but my but, grandfather had black, jet black Ferragamo Oxfords yeah. that were polished to a sheen, a almost a patent leather and sheen. He, and every he wouldn't single day. ever and think of leaving I never his saw him without, house. I never saw him needing to shave ever. Yeah, he, not would, once. he would never think to leave his house without having combed hair, shaved face, pressed yeah. khakis, shined shoes. Bleached Clorox, bleached white undershirts, and a perfectly detailed Cadillac Eldorado and waxed lawn furniture. And I and think that and shoes. I think that if the, as he imparted these types of principles into your upbringing Who waxes their it, lawn furniture. It helped you with not it, it helps 
to not be as anxious in society when yeah. you're not thinking about your yeah. wrinkled trousers or yeah. your because unshaved you take the face time or to get exactly before you go out of the house exactly That's and right. so when I was talking it so I was very grateful to be able to be um, on the trip I was very grateful as a key takeaway to be able to feel like when Madeline and I would get ready to ride the metro and we would we would put on all of our makeup and we'd put on our hair and and I did a reel on Instagram of getting ready just so that I would remember what it felt like to get ready every day to go be yeah. a normal, to go be a Parisian yeah. because everyone has their makeup you done. Telling everyone me, like, has everybody their clothes. Was dressed. Everybody had berets. I, don't, everybody I had would their be makeup really on. interested to maybe, and maybe somebody can Google this and put it in the comments or, or I would be very interested to see like the percentage of people that, uh, ha, that um, suffer from social anxiety in France or at least in Paris and see if That'd it be wouldn't low. be low, low because yeah. everyone is doing what it takes in order to take the steps necessary to be presentable yeah. in public. And they yeah. seem to all kind of know the same, the rules of yeah. engagement. Like, Did you see anybody, you were telling me you didn't see really anybody that was out of place or not dressed up or. No, I mean, all the, all the women, I mean, like Madeline said, <laughs> she said to me, she goes, Paris has humbled me. <laughs> and I said, why is that? She's like, because I'm not at home. I'm because she's, I mean, she's gorgeous. She does her makeup. She does her hair. She, every, when she goes to work, she's just, you know, she's, she's good, goes through and she does all the cues to look beautiful with, won't leave the house without her full face of makeup. And she, because of that here, if we're so relaxed and we're so casual, she gets a lot of attention. She gets a lot of, you're so beautiful. And, and she gets a lot of people that look twice when she is walking around. And in France, she's like, I, I'm just look like every other girl. <laughs> I just look, I well, look the same. She might feel that way, but yeah. But you feel that way because as a woman, at least, I mean, you, it's not normal here in America to have your... You, to go through the one hour process of lipstick and makeup and, and, and to like sit down on a metro where you're literally armpit to armpit with people. There's 200 people in your one little train uh, vestibule and you're all got yeah. your hair and makeup done. And, and everyone is in, uh, uh, it, it's nobody is in denim. They, they don't do, yeah. they don't wear denim. They don't, I mean, they're wearing, you know, uh, full length cashmere jackets or full length, full length trench coats with, you know, gloves and Scott, like, like you wear your beret, you wear your hat, you wear your scarf, you wear your gloves, you wear your long coat, you wear your boots. I mean, you are, you're set and you are How going out. How did the trip to Paris change you? I think that the thing that I felt the most em empowered by was by navigating with her she was such a good navigator oh. she was she took she like we were i mean being able to get around being able to navigate the metro system being able to find all the landmarks being able to go into french and english and being able to just be navigating i mean before we went to another country another time zone, another uh, where the native language is not English. Like it, before we went there, you know, there would be times where I would feel apprehensive, like, oh my God, I might get lost in San Jose. Like I, like I might get lost if, oh, I might not, let's not go to San Francisco because I might get lost. And that's scary to be lost in San Francisco. And now I like, oh, psh, if the signs are in English, if you, if you, yeah. you know, what do you like, want? What like, do you want? That's like we can, pretty good you, deal. I feel pretty confident that we could navigate the entire United States of America. <laughs> yep. We have our phones, even without phones, as long as you can speak English and read the English or whatever your native language is, then, then, you know, so the confidence level of being able to navigate my own land went way up. And so I think that that's part of getting seg the segue that I was working to get into is this is Thanksgiving week. We are American. I think it is important to be able to bring to the light what both Madeline and I experienced coming back from France is how grateful we are to be 
home, how grateful we are to be able to be American citizens, how grateful we are to be able to uh, have this opportunity that we have had. I mean, that is, we had the, we could have gone to Versailles and, and I, it's never been, I would love to see Versailles simply because it's like pretty cool. The palace of Versailles. But to me, it just represents taxation without representation. And that's because I'm an American, I'm sure to the core. To me, seeing all of the gold and the gilded everything of the just the dripping opulence of the royal family and thinking and knowing about the French Revolution and how, you know, the people are starving to death, but the royals are living this exuberant lifestyle it's just it was like if we get to see Versailles that'd be great it'd be beautiful I hear it's gorgeous but there's just really there's that there's that thing in me that says you know I'm an American and when there's free enterprise when there's so much when you recognize that these palaces were built on the taxes of the people and that they're living like that, then it, it's just out of whack. It's out of it's yep. out of balance. And so yeah, I agree. Palace of Versailles versus the Hearst Castle. The Hearst Castle was built with free enterprise money. Yeah, and and so I think that um, I think that as an American citizen, I'm very grateful that two hundred plus years ago uh, we had forefathers our forefathers came and said that you know we're going to start a new thing and we're going to start a new country and and i do feel greatly for the you know the native americans that were mis displaced and conquered let's just put it that way some they were, of conquered. Them were conquered some of them were killed yeah, in order camps, for this nation displaced. to become founded, um, yeah. but um, as a as a now current American who has been with generations removed from yeah. that, I'm very thankful and very grateful that we live in such a free free country that still remains free. That that I don't have to repeat everything in two different languages or three different languages because I'm just trying to feed my family that that we have this this united states of america that we live in and so uh what what would you think jeff because i've been doing a lot of talking here um what would you okay. think is you. your we're talking about thanksgiving we're talking about um america we're talking about what you see how do you see because you're in corporate america especially in Silicon Valley corporate America where where you see a, such a diverse culture i mean you have you see all nationalities and you're also i mean you work with Europe now and and you work with Canada and you work with um you've worked with Europe and you've worked overseas and things um what do you see as far as what other those those that are working here on visa or through green card, um, how do you? Is it still kind of the goal of everyone to want to work? Is is America still where people want to be in order to come from other countries, or are they are they happy being in their own country and they don't want to? Like there was a time when everybody would. You know, they just want to, they would do anything to become an American citizen. Are you still finding that to be the case as you're working with others? I think, I think others? they draw the line of permanent residency. That seems to be the, you know, in software, you have a lot of H-1B visas, mm -hmm. people from China, a lot of people from India, some people from the Netherlands and Germany who want to come here. And But they, they tend to fast track people from Western Europe, it seems like, uh, whereas the folks from Asia and, and India tend to tend to take longer to get their permanent residency. So it seems like permanent residency is kind of the, that's the, that's the creme de la creme. Cause then you can't get deported. And, you know, I would love to say that all large companies are really nice and they're great to their employees and they don't abuse the power that they have. But 
I've just seen it too many times that, you know, somebody spending 60 or $70,000 on a visa for somebody to come over and work, you know, they're going to work them 80 or a hundred hours a week until they get permanent residency and can tell them to go pound sand. Yeah. So it's not great, but once, once you have permanent residency established, which could be three years, it could be five years, it could be seven years. Um, then, then you can, you know, cut your work hours in half and, and double your income. The trouble, though, is that the immigrant mentality, which is like, you know, go get it, go get it, go get it done. Um, you know, after 15 or 20 years, a lot of times they get Americanized and the hunger. So I try to go the other way. I try to be like, man, I, I want to work. Like, I, I want to be more like the immigrants that come here that are hungry, that really want to win and make a contribution. And they just, you know, I, I feel... I. I play little tricks and games to try to make it to where I feel like I'm still trying to get to permanent residency. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good, it's a really good way to approach. I can't, I can't possibly understand what it's like to be worried about getting deported because I live here. I was born here, but, but I, but I try to emulate it and wind tunnel test it as best I can. Cause I just have so much respect for our, our immigrant brothers and sisters who come here and, a lot of them come here with nothing and a lot of them send, you know, three quarters of their paycheck back to whatever country they came from because that allows their family to live like kings while they slave away, um, you know, work on the corporate job, living in a, in a piece of junk apartment, you know, and they send all their money home to, to where you get the dollar, you get the dollar just goes like 10 X, you know, where, when you're trading it for rupees. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so important to maintain that level of ambition to be able to see that the the work that you're doing, you know, obviously you want to plant as much seed as you possibly can while you have time to plant yeah. seed. Yeah, and let's face it, I mean, you can make a lot of money in America. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends who are immigrants that have come over here in six, seven, eight years and they make $10 million and then some of them just go home. They go yeah. into India and they live like royalty in India on $10 million when here, you know, you get a couple of used cars and a nice house. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, it's such a, it's, it's so important to have this podcast based on humanities and entering the humanities into the entrepreneurship because we can find ourselves getting to that point to where we're like in the Scooby-Doo cartoons where they're running and they're not going anywhere. And so I feel like the humanity approach and, and being cognizant of rest and work and, and making sure that when we're moving forward, we're moving forward with intention, we're moving sh forward and we're actually gaining ground versus just spinning our wheels and not ever being able to enter into because because just like you were talking about like like there are there's a certain amount of of advancement that comes with that immigrant mentality of 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 attempting to get your permanent residency however you can get stuck in that never feeling like a citizen like never like you can be you can be an immigrant who has become an american but yet they're still maintaining that mentality of the old gener the old land. Yeah, they don't fit and in. They, and they they don't they're not becoming, you know, solidified as a permanent citizen. And so being able to understand the the that balance of being able to continue to move but moving forward with intention and moving forward deliberately yeah. is is something that you and I really work hard on this show and on this episode to encourage is that when we make that move, whether it's a job move, whether it's lateral, whether it's, whether it's forward, whether it's up, or even if we have to go back in order to go up, that, that the movements that we're making towards our growth and towards our advancement in our careers and in our businesses is, is intentionally is with intention and that we're making headway. Yeah. That we're moving the needle yeah, forward. We're moving the needle. We're making progress, and and um, you know whether it's the job you're working or the people that you're hanging out with or the social engagements that you're working on, or maybe you have a side hustle. You know that that concept of of just doubling down on figuring out what you want out of life and and trying to improve it. That's so. That's what we're all about. 
So it's 2023 and we're going, we're winding down 2023. We're going into a new year of 2024. What are you the most, because this is a grateful episode, because we're grateful, because we're talking about It's the grateful episode. Thanks for joining us on the What are you episode. the most uh, thankful for this year, Jeff, for 2023? Same, same thing. I mean, you and the kids and fit and health. Yeah, because I feel like as long as I got you and the kids and I'm, you know, I can stand on my own two feet and walk around that I can, I can do anything, you know, but without health, it may, it gets a lot harder because you begin, if you can't walk around, you can't exercise, you can't exercise, then the chemical reactions in your body get compromised and you can't, you know, being mentally tough takes, takes a lot more discipline on a homeostatic basis. Um, and you know, Jeffrey Joseph, Matto, Andrew, Ashi, Teddy Ness are my whole life. It's, uh, had a great series of walks on the walking trail with Andrew this week, and that was fun. And got to do spa day with Nessie when I failed to brush her hair for eight days because I didn't know that little <laughs> girl's hair needed to be brushed every day. I guess that's a thing. Uh, so we turned her upside down. And Our hair is just a little longer than it's your hair. It's a little longer. So I turned her upside <laughs> down and dunked her head in a bucket of conditioner and then uh spent about an hour and a half on the day before you came home brushing her hair one strand at a time so that it would look nice for her and for you i appreciate that um and um had some good time with osh so and you got, got a new i mean this year you've gotten a new job you you've gotten yeah had a good year this a, year an make, awesome made opportunity a good, and made a good uh income this year again you started this podcast so that's yeah, closed there's a, been a lot I closed of a big new... deal at oracle before i left and um, we got a couple deals coming up here that we should close early 2024 for the company I'm working for right now. So we got the podcast. We got 30. What are we at, Andrew? 36. Yep, he's nodding his he's head. He's nodding. Yeah, this 36. is episode 36. So we'll be real close to 40 episodes, if not beyond, by the end of the. And then uh, the newsletter, which I'm still working on drafting with Notion and getting getting several and copies the, of that ready I mean, to go. So the hundred subscribers. That I'm yeah, going to say that we get 100, 100 subscribers on YouTube. Subscribers Holy by the moly. End of this Any year. of you folks who are out there saying, well, Mr. Beast has 100 million, whatever. Man, getting from zero to 100 subscribers was, that's a lot. That that took like 10 months to do that. So um, I'm excited that we got to 100. We should probably have some Prosecco or something when we get there. Yeah, for sure. What are we at? We're at 94. Andrew's nodding his head again. 94. 94. Yeah, 94 and, subscribers. And we, we love year. and we're grateful for all 94 yeah, all subscribers. 94. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening. I mean, I'm just glad that you guys can enjoy what Jessica and I try to try to put out there. You know, it is the best that we can do um, with the time that we have, with the lighting that we have, with the cameras, with the 12 by 12 wood pop-up building in our garage and the drapes and the halogen lighting and um, hey, the chairs that's that the you number got. one like, response we, from we our guests want... is like, "Wow, that's really cool. You guys have a cool little studio." So, so yeah, I'm very, we're very, we're very thankful, grateful for to this the studio. studio. <laughs> yeah, it's it just. I mean, I'm going into the holidays this year, and we've had some people that have passed away and yeah. loved ones this year. Uh, close family friend. Um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, friend of ours in his in his 20s took his life and uh your grandmother passed away in january and we've had other friends my my stepmother passed away in october last year so just just getting to a year period of time um and it's you know it's um it's not always good it's it's certainly not easy um but it is the way that it is and learning how to just deal with life the way that it is and not not think that it should be a different way or that horrible things don't happen to good people. Um, I wish I could say that that was the case, but horrible things happen to good people. And, and it, it, it just seems it's, like it's, it's hard the sometimes. more grateful that we can become in times of stress and taking our eyes off of the situation of the, the, the walls caving in and instead recognizing, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm here today. Like what can, what can we find count? that's uh the white christmas we're going into the holidays and and you know when i'm tired and i can't sleep there's that song i count my blessings when instead I'm of shame i'm tired and i can't sleep yes i count my blessings instead of sheep which is a great reminder to make sure that we are maintaining a position of gratefulness and gratitude and and you know your boss might be yelling down 
I, you know, yelling, yelling at you, your, your Don't cat, your me. cat might be, you know, your cat might be respond, you know, your cat might be rebelling. Your kids might be rebelling, your but cat, your cat might be like, I'm not taking this anymore. Exactly. I'm out of here. You better change that litter box I'm dead. or I'm going on the carpet. Okay, exactly. But what can we be grateful for? You know, we're grateful that we have a roof over our head. We're grateful that we have. Oh my God. If you can't find bellies. something to be grateful for, you need to turn this podcast off right now and call somebody that loves you. Because if you got an iPhone right now, that's, that's let me tell you. Yeah, if you got an <laughs> iPhone, you ought to be glad that you don't have to walk to go get water yeah. 10 miles. There's people in India that have to walk for 10 miles yeah. with a gas can that you'd strap to the back of a Jeep to go get some water. Yeah. And and guess what? They're grateful. Yeah. Yeah. There's always something. There's always something to be grateful for, to Absolutely. have gratitude for. Absolutely. And you deserve to train yourself to be grateful, for goodness sakes. It is yeah. so great. I mean, to be married 27 years, to have seven kids, to have all of our kids healthy. None of them have, thank God, none of, none of our kids have mental health issues or emotional issues. They don't have financial problems. They don't have physical health problems. They don't have relationship problems. We all have issues, We have issues you, and things but, that we're dealing with, but it's not like major stuff. Yeah. Like our kids are great. They are. Our marriage is great. And your marriage is great too. The fact that you have somebody to be married to. And if you don't have somebody to be married to, then be grateful for the person that's on the way. So there's no excuse. We need to like raise the bar, raise the standard to gratefulness and world-class excellence in what we're doing because, man, it just I cannot imagine living a life, going through life, like not being grateful most of the time. Yeah. That would just suck. Yeah, I always say that, you know, my grandmother, she could have been walking down a dark, dingy alley with you know i think of a a new york city alleyway with rats and and you know you've got garbage dumpsters with garbage and stuff she could she could have walked down an alleyway that was just disgusting and she would she was the type of person that would see a flower popping up in the crack or even a a weed popping up out of the crack of a of a sidewalk and she would focus on that and oh, say, Oh, how pretty, such a nice dandelion you know, so growing I, up out of the crack next to the dumpster and, in the alleyway. And it's like, she yeah, would do that. She would, she, have, would do she, that. she would do that. And that was yeah. always the reminder for me to be able to say, you know, scripture says a heart without hope will grow sick. And that there's a lot of really sick people, a lot of people that are really hurting that don't yeah. have any hope. It's and, they don't have hope. and a lot of it is because of, they have just haven't been, trained and maybe they haven't had people in their lives speaking yeah. into them and showing them and being that person that's going to see the silver lining see yeah. the flower that's growing in a wheel uh, in a field of wheat of weeds yeah and so and it's not like we're here to, we're not here to poo poo people that are having a tough time not at all no. not at all but you know we're we've, just here to we've encourage. been through i mean <laughs> we've we've lived in in piece of junk apartments with bars on the windows i lived in my car for a while jessica has had you know, her uh, her questions as to, you know, what is she doing with the three kids and no money, no groceries. And, oh, my God, I, I, I mean, we've never questioned being married to each other. But we've well, when certainly you, when asked, you have like, three, what is going on because we're you have struggling hungry, so bad. Hungry kids and all you got are potatoes. It's yeah. like, look, kids. Potatoes and cheese for the last 15 days of the month until the cheese runs out. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become as creative as I possibly great. can with these potatoes. Or I'm, we're going we're gonna to make pancakes yeah. and we're going to have pancakes. When your parents you know, send you groceries in the mail... Yeah. Like Yeah, but but you can we can be we yeah, can we great. can train ourselves but through our resolve to train ourselves to be grateful. Yep. We've been able to uh as wealth came and as we became more and more successful over time, uh it ended up becoming something that now we can walk into a uh a fine dining restaurant and we're not just grateful. Like there are a lot of really wealthy people that go into fine dining restaurants that are not grateful and they're, they just, they're rude and they treat the servers rude and they can't identify with anybody and they're super demanding and they're and, just, and that's okay too. That's okay. It's totally but okay. When but I go in because of the, because of the them. lean times, yeah. when we go when I in, think about the bars on the windows and the times when we had I'm so grateful. $9 in pennies to yeah. buy gas, to get home in our four cylinder car that was running on three cylinders. Yeah. You know, we were getting about six miles to the gallon and we had, we needed all $9 of those pennies to get home. 
Um, it's, and it's, it's so, I'm so great. So I'm still nice grateful to, to like, fill up the tank. Fill up the I tank. know, right? Like, yep. it, like it hasn't, no matter how much we, it's been a long time since we've been, since we haven't had enough money yeah. to fill up our tank. Yeah, it's been a and 20, yet 20 every time years. we go to fill up the tank, I'm still I'm like, like saying <gasps> it's still, th- oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I get to fill the tank. Tank in the car. <laughs> yep. That's a big deal. And we're grateful for that. So. Thanks, everybody, for being with us today on the Jeff Heilman Project on November, what is it, 21? Today is the 21st, but 21st. this episode will come out on Friday. It'll so. come out on Friday. So this is not the 21st for you who might be listening to it, but it's the 21st for us when we're cutting the... And, um, We'd like to hear you from you. What are you What are you grateful for? Year. Please leave in the comments that uh, Jeff comments and I, we check and it. Text messages. We pay 40 bucks a month for a yep. number so you guys can text us. So yes, text us. Text us. Tell us what you're Send thankful for. We'd love messages. to hear from you. We would you. like to know what you would like us to cover. We would like to know who you would like to have on for guests. And thank you to uh, Jason Sullivan and Mike Williams, Williams and... Um, Rob Angel. Rob and... Christopher um, Johnson. Christopher... All of our guests. Um, all, all, all these Jeff guys. Jeff Bush. Jeff Bush and uh, Matt that was yeah. on a couple of weeks ago. So we're, we're grateful to our guests. We're not, we're not done for the year. We've still got some episodes to do, but this is kind of a, kind of a pivot into the fall season for, uh, for the Jeff Heilman Project podcast and newsletter. And look forward to seeing you guys online wherever podcasts are sold. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. And we look forward to a wonderful rest of 2023 and 2024 to come. See you next time. <laughs>